When I woke, Carla was gone, her blanket and pillow neatly stacked on the couch. I showered and dressed, then headed to the office. I assumed I'd find her there, albeit not so bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, given her alcohol consumption the previous night. I assumed wrong. The only thing that awaited me in the office was a message from Mercedes Sandoval saying she'd be stopping by around nine and a scattered pile of papers on the floor beneath the fax machine. I checked my watch, 817. The mess on the floor turned out to be my to-do list, two sets of summons that had to be delivered by the end of the day. I pulled the stack together, checked the addresses, and headed out. I hate the process serving side of the job, particularly when Carla isn't with me. I'd grown used to her being there to blunt the treachery, but there was no way I was waiting around for Mercy Sandoval, not without going through those papers first. I called Carla's cell and left a message, then dialed the number to the meanwhile. Muggs sounded only slightly less irritated than he had the previous night. He barked out the greeting. Meanwhile, Hey, buddy. Sorry about last night. Don't buddy me, Morno. I'm not in the mood. Didn't get my full eight hours of beauty sleep. Glasses clinked in the background, and I figured he was washing dishes. Because the bar doesn't exactly do a hearty business, most of the time Muggs has to play greeter, bartender, cook, and dishwasher. Ha! With a mug like that, you need more than eight hours a night to make a difference. Morneau, was there a point to this call other than to irritate me? I've got the insurance adjuster coming in 15 minutes to assess the fire damage and a sink full of glasses that need washing. The background noise seemed to rise exponentially with his level of annoyance. Just need to get some papers out of Carla's car. Is your spare house key still under that questionable garden gnome? It's not a gnome. It's a gargoyle, and the key is there, but the car's not. Carla had a cab drop her off around 6 this morning. So, in addition to the lack of beauty rest, I haven't even enjoyed my first cup of coffee before your assistant took over my kitchen. There's nothing pleasant about runny eggs, burnt toast, and an overly cheerful woman first thing in the morning, Morneau. I probably would have found it amusing if that last bit wasn't so disconcerting. She say where she was headed? Nope, and I didn't ask. Thanks, Muggs. I disconnected the call abruptly, suddenly in no mood for niceties. This did not bode well for the unsuspecting schlubs about to be served. I was on I-75 and decided my first stop would be Melvindale. I'd circle around to my second stop on the way back to the office. I cut off a Pontiac Firebird being driven by a lead-footed octogenarian merging onto the highway. As he pulled around and flew past me, I was gifted with a craggy middle finger in response. Gloria Hillman was the name of the woman I'd be serving divorce papers, and I hoped the task would be effortless, because any effort on my part would require me to muster enough empathy to appear pleasant. I wasn't feeling particularly pleasant as I pulled past the driveway of a split-level home in the downriver suburb of Detroit. There was a newish Ford Explorer parked in front of the house, so it appeared someone was home. I slid around the cul-de-sac and parked on the curb so my car couldn't be seen from the Hillman residence. As I pulled the paperwork together, I watched a Girl Scout dressed in full regalia tugging a red wagon full of her wares down the sidewalk. She stopped a few houses down, straightened her blouse, and then sauntered up the driveway with all the confidence of a tiny soldier on an important mission. With her chin high and her back straight, she rang the doorbell. I knocked and waited a full minute for the door to open. A well-appointed woman dressed in gray slacks and a button-up sweater took in the Grateful Dead concert tee under my flannel shirt. She didn't seem particularly impressed. 
Can I help you? That depends. I rifled through the paperwork. Are you Gloria Hillman? Her eyes narrowed. Well, that depends. Who's asking? Detective Dexmore No. I held the papers out and her lip furled with disdain for approximately three seconds before she slammed the door in my face. I took a deep cleansing breath and knocked again. She wasn't biting. I knocked again, then yelled. Lady, not signing won't keep you married. It'll just piss off a line of people, starting with me. On down the line to the lucky fella who's apparently trying to saw off his ball and chain, all the way up to the judge. You want to come off as a ball buster, that's fine. I glanced down at the paperwork again. I've dealt with Judge Armitage before. This could cost you, particularly if you're looking for alimony. There was no answer, and I wasn't in the mood to cajole the woman into submission. So it was fortuitous that as I stalked back to my car, the Girl Scout was heading in my direction. I pointed back at the Hillman residence. Hey, you delivering cookies to that house? The young girl nodded wirily. That's right, I'm a stranger, and you shouldn't be talking to me, but you are, so tell me something. What's the name of the lady that lives in that house? She looked up and down the street, probably comforted by all the neighbors out and about. One couple walking a dog, another man pulling his garbage bin out to the curb. Finally, she cleared her throat, squared her shoulders, and said, Mrs. Hillman. How'd you like to make ten dollars? She eyed me suspiciously as I pulled out my wallet. I'm going to be honest with you, little lady. I need to give these papers to her, but she won't take them. She'll open the door for you, since she wants what you're delivering. You think when she does, you can say, Mrs. Hillman, you've been served, and hand her the papers? The young lady nodded gravely as she took the papers from me, sliding them in between the stacks of cookie boxes. I saw something like this on cops once, but the bad guy ran out the back and climbed the fence. He got bit by a pit bull on the other side. Grown-ups are kind of stupid sometimes, aren't they? I was beginning to like this kid. Yep, at least 35% of the population shouldn't be allowed to operate a moving vehicle. When I held out a $10 bill, she smiled and shook her head. Nope, 20. And you gotta buy six boxes of cookies. Kids these days are way too savvy, if you ask me. I really wasn't in any position to haggle with her, but I kind of wanted to see her in action. Six boxes? That's steep. I'll go 20 in cash and one box. She parked both fists on her little hips. Hmm, 20 in cash and five boxes of cookies. I crossed my arms over my chest and tapped my foot. 20 in two boxes. She crossed her arms over her chest and widened her stance, imitating mine. Twenty and four boxes. I gave her the stink eye. Twenty and three boxes, and you'll like it. Final offer. Fine. After I handed her the cash and picked through her stock for long enough that she sighed and rolled her eyes, our transaction was complete. I watched her roll the little cookie wagon up the Hillman driveway. The woman answered the door and smiled brightly until the little girl shoved the papers at her. I was just rolling past the end of her driveway as the Girl Scout delivered her line, like the method actor or district attorney she'll eventually become. The Hillman woman looked up and glared at me as I gave her a military salute and rolled down the street, a tiny bit happier than I'd been five minutes earlier. My second stop was in the West Side Industrial Area, a warehouse I recognized as one of the few still manufacturing Chrysler automotive parts. After showing my ID and requesting to see Harold Layton, I was buzzed through a set of double doors onto a bustling factory floor. The security guard directed me to a set of metal stairs that led to an office on the second floor. It was a typical warehouse setup, large open area, winding conveyor belt, lots of noise, 
and people with one-piece jumper coveralls manning their respective stations. I took the stairs and walked what amounted to a caged floor that ran the perimeter of the room. Three sides were part of the line, winding from the upper to lower floor. The back wall had one door and a large window, presumably for viewing the productivity, but the blinds were drawn. When I opened the door, a strangled squeak came from a man behind a computer, just before he lobbed a can directly at me. It bounced off my head and hit the floor. Holy Jeebus, Leighton! You greet all your guests with projectiles? I rubbed my head and stared at the object on the floor, because something didn't look right about it. At first glance, it looked like a soda can, but there was some sort of pink plastic protruding out one end. Even when I bent to retrieve it, I had no idea what I was holding until I heard the distinct sound of a zipper. That instantly pulled it all together for me. But to make absolutely sure I hadn't suddenly gone nuts, I looked at the contraption in my hand for a couple more seconds before dropping it on the floor in disgust. Aw, oh, jeez. I wiped my infected hand on my pant leg. Ever thought of locking the door, Einstein? The object in question was made for self-pleasure, though I can't imagine anything killing a hard-on quicker than being balls deep in a can full of plastic pussy. Even with my limited access to the thing, I can attest to the fact that the rubbery material lining the can and foaming over the edges in some sort of comedic rendition of the female anatomy felt nothing like a human body part. Harold Layton was less embarrassed than pissed off at being interrupted mid-whatever. Get out. Gladly. I pulled the paperwork from under my arm and tossed it on the desk, noticing his computer screen featured a porn site dedicated to nubile Asian women. Just sign this and I'll be on my way. You, sir, have been served. Layton quit trying to cover his woody and snatched the papers, rifling through them. Just sign the papers, or I can leave without a signature. Means nothing to me, but judges tend to notice things like that. Particularly when I write up a few paragraphs about how the servee was in the middle of jerking himself to Chinatown on the clock. He scoffed and minimized the browser. Just shut up. I don't want to hear anything from someone who barges in here to steal my hard-earned money. Yeah, I can see how hard you're working, Harold. How much did that little toy set you back? You probably could have bought little Jimmy or Jane a couple new Lego sets for what it cost you to have that monstrosity delivered in a plain brown wrapper. Harold grabbed the papers and signed them. You gonna stand there in a Grateful Dead t-shirt and judge me? I ripped off my copy and handed him back the paperwork. Hell, I don't care what you do with your Johnson. I was merely pointing out that the higher-ups might have something to say about you jerking off on the clock. I looked down at the canned genitalia. Tell me something, Harold. Afterward, when you're standing at the sink, rinsing that thing out, because I'm not comfortable assuming you don't clean it, but when you're standing there with the bottle brush and the palm olive, do you ever find yourself wondering where it all went wrong? Get out! Harold stood and his baggy trousers fell to his ankles. Apparently, he hadn't buttoned up after zipping. At that precise moment, one of the factory workers entered the office, stared at his boss for three beats, then turned on his heel and left without a word. Not a bad day, 